If you like my videos and want to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Thank you. In the early 1980s, there were two people that were too cool for school. The first one was Arthur Fonzarelli, otherwise known as the Fonz. The other one was 007 himself, James Bond. With his high-tech gadgets and his super slick car, he made being a spy extremely cool and extremely fun. No matter which actor was portraying the character, he always preferred his martinis, and possibly his women, shaken, not stirred. But no matter what he was up to, he would always save the day with a cocky, smug smile upon his face. In today's video, we're not talking about the man behind the three-digit number. We're talking about the game that was inspired by the James Bond franchise, Spy Hunter. What TV show did this game draw inspiration from? What was the original name of this game? So grab your weapon and get ready to fire because this is the history of Spy Hunter. The year is 1982 and game designer George Gomez is vacationing in Japan. His next arcade game was going to feature helicopters, but by chance he had picked up a Walkman and a cassette tape of James Bond's greatest hits. While listening to the music, he could see the game unfold in his head. Not only was he a fan of the music, but he was also a big fan of the movies. He loved the spots where Bond would have to outmaneuver or outdrive his opponents, and the music played a big part in the overall experience. He wanted to replicate that feeling in an arcade game. When he returned home from his trip, he went straight to his bosses at Midway, who greenlit the project immediately. Mr. Gomez opted to use the MCR3 board, which was used on previous Midway games such as Tron. Journey and Tapper. This game was to be Midway's first vertically scrolling arcade game. Games released prior to this would have to be either on a single screen or a flick style type of scrolling. Mr. Gomez had used a giant roll of graph paper and mapped out the entire playfield with obstacles, events, and game notes littering the pages. Mr. Gomez was also a fan of the TV show Knight Rider, in particular the star of the show, the car, Kit. At various times, the car will drive into the back of a moving truck to get upgrades or diagnostics to run on it. He knew that in his game, the car would have to get various upgrades, but didn't like that the car would just automatically grow weapons. He decided to add a similar truck to his game, taking inspiration from Knight Rider. After you successfully enter the truck and your weapons are upgraded, the theme from Peter Gunn plays in the background. The Knight Rider influence was even more apparent when you take a look at the arcade flyer. Specifically, the dashboard of the car you're driving looks very similar to Kit. Also, that sure looks more like Michael Knight, otherwise known as David Hasselhoff, than it does James Bond. According to an internal memo, some of the original titles included Spymobile, Leadfoot, and Drunk Tank. Originally, the James Bond theme was used here, but unfortunately they could not get the license for the music, so they had to change it. In early prototypes, the car looked too similar to James Bond's Aston Martin vehicle, so obviously they had to change it. The name of the car in the game is G6155, which is actually George Gomez's birthday. The arcade cabinet came in two flavors a stand-up version as well as a sit-down model. You control your vehicle with a steering wheel which is equipped with four buttons to use your various weapons with. There is also a low and high gear shift as well as a gas pedal. Spy Hunter was released in 1983 by Midway. You take control of your G6155 Interceptor as you barrel down the road at top speed taking out as many enemies as you can all the while trying to score as high as possible. 
Your car is equipped with twin machine guns, but there are various weapon upgrades throughout the game, including a smoke screen, oil slicks, and missiles. You can bump into enemy vehicles and ram them off the road or shoot them with your machine guns. If the collision is too hard with another vehicle, your car can be destroyed. If you go too far off the road, your car will be disabled. Also, a helicopter will drop bombs leaving craters in the road which have to be avoided. Be careful not to shoot any civilians because your score will not increase for several seconds. To upgrade your weapons, you have to enter the weapons van which can be summoned periodically. There are certain points of the game where you can enter a boathouse and your car will be transformed into a decked out super fast interceptor speedboat. You will face enemy boats for a brief period of time after doing this. If you drive far enough into the game, the season will change into a winter wonderland. The game was a bona fide hit in the arcades and was ported to various computers and consoles. The first version we're going to take a look at is the MS-DOS port. Now let's get the bad out of the way first. If your colors of choice are pink and blue pastels, then this is right up your alley. While the graphics are fairly detailed, especially for a 1984 DOS game, the sound effects and music leave a lot to be desired. If you stick your fingers in your ears at just the right angle, it does sound just like the arcade game. Otherwise, you'll be treated to a series of bloops and bleeps which makes it sound like your computer is passing gas. Now that we've got the bad out of the way, what's left? Well. It is fast and fairly smooth in terms of animation and gameplay, but really that's about it. Up next is the Atari 2600 version, and all in all, it's a pretty good attempt. The game moves at a fast frenetic pace which perfectly captures the speed of the original. There are plenty of enemies on the road and most of the features from the arcade game are included. The music and sound effects are pretty good, with a nice little attempt at the Peter Gunn theme included. One downside is that you have to use the other controller plugged into the second joystick port to select your weapons due to the Atari only having one fire button. First impressions of the BBC Micro version are pretty good, but if you spend more than 30 seconds with it, you'll realize that looks can be deceiving. Everything moves along at a nice speed and the graphics are detailed, although the palette is a bit garish. The sound effects and music are pretty good with a nice rendition of the Peter Gunn theme. So what's the problem? There are hardly any enemies on the road. Rather than fight against the enemies, you end up fighting with the road as you try to stay on for any length of time. It feels like you're driving on glass. The Spectrum version is a decent attempt, although speed-wise it falls a bit short. The scrolling is a little too choppy with the speed of the game running at about 75% of the arcade original. The sprites are large and detailed with color clash kept to a bare minimum. The controls are responsive with the ability to maneuver in and out of traffic with ease. There are lots of enemies on the road to take out, so you better be on your toes. There is no music, which is a bit of a shame, but there is rudimentary machine gun fire. You say you're looking for the worst conversion of Spy Hunter? I think we may have a winner. While on the surface the Apple II version does a decent job of replicating the arcade game's graphics, it all goes downhill once you see it in motion. The scrolling is too jittery, making it hard to maneuver around your enemies. There is very little snaking of the highway when combined with the speed of the gameplay makes this game just a bit too easy. The water sections have also been completely removed as well. How about the music? Nowhere to be found. The Amstrad version is up next and while the graphics are nice and colorful, the speed of the gameplay really lets it down. The scrolling is very choppy, as well as making it hard to compensate when dealing with the enemies on screen. That is, if you can find any. Another thing you have to compensate for is the slippery as ice controls. There is also no music or sound to speak of, putting this near the top of the worst Spy Hunter conversions ever. The Atari 800 port is very well done aside from the limited color palette. The scrolling is very smooth and fast, almost as fast as the arcade original. There isn't as much traffic on the road as found in other versions, but that just makes it a little bit easier. The playability is top notch with your car being nice and responsive. The Peter Gunn theme is well represented along with very good sound effects. Overall, an excellent port. 
the good old Commodore 64 has one of the best ports of Spy Hunter. Looking very similar to the excellent Atari 800 version but with brighter visuals and more traffic on screen. The speed of the gameplay is top notch and the controls feel very similar to the arcade original. The sound effects and especially the Peter Gunn theme sounds great thanks to the wonderful SID chip. The ColecoVision port is another excellent conversion. The speed of the gameplay is very close to that of the arcade game with large sprites. The controls are nice and tight with plenty of on-screen enemies to contend with. The Peter Gunn theme sounds great especially considering the hardware it's running on. As an added bonus, you can even use the Super Controllers with its extra buttons to control your weapons. Midway Arcade Hits was released for the Game Boy Color and featured two games, Moon Patrol and Spy Hunter. Spy Hunter is very well done as it should be considering the game was released 16 years after the arcade original. Detailed colorful sprites and fast moving gameplay makes this accurate in every way possible. Even the tiny Game Boy Color belts out a pretty good rendition of the Peter Gunn theme. The game was also released for the Game Boy Advance and is actually the best portable version of Spy Hunter not running under emulation. Everything looks very close to the original arcade game from the colors to the speed of the gameplay. The, the sound effects and music are very faithful to the original arcade game. Upon first glance, you would think this was the actual arcade game. And finally, we have the NES version. This game appears to be running way too fast, making split-second decisions even more difficult. The graphics are well done, although not quite as colorful as other versions. There are plenty of enemies on screen at once with nary a slow down in sight. Sound effects and music are very good. Thanks to the success of the original arcade game, Spy Hunter 2 was released into the arcades. This game ditches the top down viewpoint and instead switches to a 3D overhead behind the car viewpoint much to its detriment. Your old barrage of weapons are back including oil slicks, missiles and smoke screens but unfortunately the playability of the sequel is just not there. However, there is a two player co-op mode where players can help each other out, but honestly it's just not very fun. This game was so bad in fact that not one single home conversion was ever produced. A remake was released in 2001 for the various home consoles and windows simply titled Spy Hunter. This was a very good reimagining of the original arcade game only with current gen graphics and gameplay. A lot of the same weapons are available but this time around the focus is more on mission based gaming with a total of 14 levels to complete. Your vehicle will transform seamlessly from land to sea just like in the original. The Peter Gunn theme plays throughout so all in all it's a very good updated version. In 2003, the game was released as a part of the compilation pack called Midway Arcade Treasures. This collection includes 24 classic Midway Arcade games which are running under emulation so what you're getting is the actual arcade game at home. Spy Hunter was very innovative for its time. Not only was the gameplay addicting but the atmosphere was as well thanks to the Peter Gunn theme. With the steering wheel in your hand, you felt like a spy on a mission trying to save the day. It's another one of those arcade games that's nice to try out at home, but to get the overall experience, you need to try it out in a real arcade. If you never have before, give it a shot. You'll be glad you did. If you like my videos and want to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Also, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to my content. It's the only way my little channel can grow. Thanks for watching.